it up. This video is all about Kubernetes policies, specifically using Tiverno and its paid version, Nirmata. This is actually a edited down version of a previous live episode. And if you don't know about the live streams, they're here every Thursday on my channel. But I wanted to edit this one down so you get just the essential information because I think if you're someone who's responsible for a Kubernetes platform or a Kubernetes cluster, you are going to eventually need policies. One of your goals is gonna to be to make developers more productive by giving them more access to deliver applications to your clusters. And in order to do that, you need to give them guardrails. You need to basically keep them in their lane and make sure that they follow the right security settings and all the other stuff that you would need to make sure happens when they're deploying their new apps. In order to do that, you need a policy system and there's multiple options, at least three or four that I can think of. And I prefer Kyverno. It's the one that sticks in YAML, just like Kubernetes YAML. It doesn't require that I learn another way to write the policies. It's all right in the YAML there. And it's pretty easy to get started with. So I had the founder of the project, Jim Baguada, on the show a few months back. So enjoy this edited down version of the live stream on Kyverno policies. All the way from the West Coast of the United States, I have my special guest, Jim Baguada. He's the CEO and co-founder of Nirmata, and that spun off a project for the CNCF called Caverno. So we're gonna break down all of those things. Thank you so much, Jim, for being on the show. Thank you for having me, pleasure. Yeah, and if you didn't know Jim's background, he's uh, actually currently a co-chair of the Kubernetes Policy Working Group, and we're gonna actually ask in a minute what that's about. And then he previously worked running the cloud practices team at Cisco. So he's got a lot of experience in this area and this is kind of how he got started with his team. So we're excited to have him here. Let's get into it. So Jim, tell me your origin story of how you got to Nirmata, how Caverno started. Yeah, no, I would love to. So uh, our focus, given our background in telecommunications was always around, you know, we had a strong kind of policy component in our platform. And eventually that led to, as we worked with several customers and we would always ask like, why is it that they picked Nirmata? What do they love about it? You know, what features they would like to see? And it always kind of came down to policies and policy management. So in around 2018, 2019 is when we decided to open source our policy engine, which we named Kiverno. Kiverno is a Greek word for to govern. So it kind of fits in with policies for Kubernetes. And, you know, we donated Kiverno to the CNCF about a year later. And it's phenomenal to see the community adoption and growth since. Yeah, you were saying, uh, you were telling me before the show, 2,000 stars on GitHub, and that's not easy to come by. <laughs> <laughs> especially right. in a, especially in CNCF where we we get new product announcements every week. That's so true. yeah, congrats on that. And and I think something that would help me and hopefully some of our audience is when we talk about when you say the term policy management, what is and isn't that? Yeah, that's a good question, right? Because as a developer, if you tell tell me or tell anyone that okay, I have to kind of follow some policies Typically, we think about a security organization sitting in some other uh, corner of the building and they're setting these policies and kind of doing some governance or compliance mapping and things like that, right? Here, what we're talking about, and, and the reason why at least I feel Kiverno sees so much success is really we embracing policy as code. And we're codifying policies almost as a digital contract to make it easy for what developers need to do in Kubernetes, right? So if you think about any Kubernetes cluster within any enterprise or organization, there's several roles that are involved in operating, managing, securing the cluster, the shared services, and then the workloads, the applications which need to run on that cluster. So how do you do all of this at scale is still a dauntingly complex set of problems to solve. and policies, we believe, play a major role in securing and automating those handoffs across these different, you know, we talk about DevOps and DevSecOps. So if you think about a developer who wants to deploy an application, they want to focus maybe on that 20 or 30% of the 
resource manifest that they care about, right? Right. And then you have the ops team that wants to set operational best practices, configurations, like maybe they want to control how the pod security context is configured in every workload. And so that would be uh, something that an ops team does. And of course, the security team wants to see periodic reports from all of this and, and wants to make sure that their container images are secure, that there's vulnerability scan performed, that the right configurations are in place and are being enforced. So yes, of, maybe you know all of this can be done manually, but that seems... Uh, again, very complex and very cumbersome. And we believe that by, you know, approaching or policies or making policies as part of the this, this digital handoff or contract, it can be fully automated. So one interesting thing in Caverno from the very beginning is policies were not just about verification and enforcement, but they were very heavily about automation as well, right? So Caverno has full support for mutate, generate other type of rules, which we can, you know, dive into in, in more detail to show how these policies would operate and how some of this automation can be handled. Yeah. So does this include things like RBAC? Are network policies involved? Are, I mean, it sounds like there's some host policy stuff applying here, right? If we're talking right. about not elevating to root or maybe limiting certain bind mounts or something like that, or whatever, ports, something like that. What's in scope? Yeah, so let's, let's take a look at some examples, right? And I'll, I'll actually, I can, I'll, let me pull up Kiverno, I'll share my screen. Yeah, so if you see how Kiverno is organized, just to maybe quickly explain its architecture, and then I'll dive into what sort of policies can be applied. So Kiverno uh, installs itself as an admission controller, right? And I'll, I'll show this on my local cluster of what it does. But when you install Kiverno, it plugs in because Kubernetes is extensible. Um, it allows admission control webhooks to run within your cluster. Kiverno securely registers itself with the control plane as a mutating and validating admission controller. Then based on the policy set you configure in Kiverno, and Kiverno policies are Kubernetes resources, so they can be managed uh, with any kind of, you know, if you're using Visual Studio Code for or other tools like Customize, Kubectl, you can use all of those to manage Kiverno policies. But then based on that policy set that you configure, Kiverno will register itself you know, with the API server to receive those requests and then apply the policies. So again, based on your settings, you can block certain requests like we were talking about if you don't want to allow certain bind mounts, right? Which is a best practice for pod security by default, you can deny that. And then for certain namespaces, you can add exceptions to say you want to allow uh, select configurations, right? So Kubernetes itself, of course, has, if you go to the Kubernetes docs and look at policies, they they will kind of you know mention uh, a few objects like for RBAC, for pod security, a network policy, which are built-in policy objects, but those are typically not enough for all of the best practices as well as security configurations required. So which is where other admission controllers like Kiverno or even OPA Gatekeeper, which is another project which also provides policies in Kubernetes. These are highly recommended for any production deployment, right? And once these policies are configured, again, it's seamless for users because they're just making kubectl requests or API server requests and the policies are being applied in their background uh, and they can see the errors, warnings, and the results from these policies. Nice. So at the practical level, you're talking about if I'm the developer running my app and I'm probably partially responsible for the YAML I have to create, I'm no longer saddled with the expectation of knowing all the security policies and implementing it in my own YAML. This can this is sort of farming it out to the ops team and the sec team to have their own resources that they're managing separately. And I can feel safe that basically the way I know I didn't follow the rules was I did something wrong in my YAML and it gets declined essentially on apply or get, what is the that's, expected? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And let's take a look at this in example. So I have, I'll show a quick demo on my local cluster. So I'm just going to use, I'll go to my shell and I have 
you know, a mini cube cluster I just kind of spun up uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the standard install command uh, just to pull down Kiverno and install it, right? So at this point, all that's required is once you run this and there's a Helm chart as well, but just by running the YAMLs, now you see it's a registered a number of custom resources. It uses internally, if you're running HA, it will do a leader election across like different instances of Kiverno. And then it also, there's a number of different roles that kind of will configure for different policy levels, et cetera. It registers itself as a webhook. And now it's at this point, it should be ready for operations, right? So if we do the logs, I'll, uh, so Kiverno is up and running and it shows if you kind of scroll down here, uh, it says, okay, it's ready. The webhook uh, has registered and it's ready. But at this point, I have no policies, right? So if I still do a kubectl run, and one of my favorite demos is something I saw, I think it was Duffy Cooley who showed this at a kubecon. If you kind of run this one liner, right? What it's doing is, Basically, it's starting a container, it's changing some of the YAML configurations, it's running an NS enter and then trying to get access to a bind mount to, to slash proc here, right? So if I run this on my cluster, which is just a default cluster, nothing else configured and running, the way container security works, of course, is at this point, I can see it looks like I'm on a Linux root. And if I look at what permissions I have, root permissions at this point, right? So by default, because Kubernetes doesn't provide some of these, these type of any, anything to kind of block or enforce pod security, either the recommendation is to run entry capabilities like PSPs have been deprecated, but there is a pod security admission controller being developed, but that is not as flexible as things you could do with, you know, engines like Kiverno. So to prevent this, and by the way, just to kind of show, if you go to like war logs, let's see what we can. See over here, if I go to log and contain, I should be able to see all my containers running here, right? So sure enough, it shows for DNS and other things. So obviously just by running, having permissions to run a container image, I now have, I'm able to get to, you know, root and to be able to at least access other things within the setup itself, right? So obviously not a great thing and something we want to prevent. So. I'll show, you know, kind of as a next step, what can you do? Uh, I'll first delete this container. So we'll just go ahead and delete root. And I'm going to install Kiverno's implementation of pod security standards, right? So if you go to Kiverno policies, and by the way, in the community, there's a, almost like 130 sample policies. But for this demo, I'm just going to go to pod security and I'm going to run, you know, this customized command which will implement about 15 different controls. So there is in Kubernetes, there's pod security standards. There's three levels that are recommended or uh, standardized, I should say. Baseline is typically what you, you would want to at least run at baseline. But ideally you're running at restricted and just adding exceptions for workloads that need other privileges, right? So in this case, what we'll do, going back to my cluster, I'll run a customized command which is going to um, pull down about 10 to 15 different policies and put them in force mode, right? So I want to make sure uh, that these policies are blocking workloads, you know, which are running with higher privileges than required, right? So as you can see now, and CPOL is just short form for cluster policy. So I have a bunch of policies which should become ready in a few seconds. So we'll see a few more of those go ready. And as that happens, now Kiverno will start enforcing these on any workload that's being created. So the main ones we want to block are running as root user, things like that, right? So we should be good at this point. So let's try that same command again, which previously we were able to kind of get to host and see what happens. So immediately Kiverno is blocking because of several policies failed, right? So first off. If you're running in the restricted mode, you're required to drop privilege capabilities within your container. You shouldn't allow privilege escalation. You should set run as non root to true. So all of this is kind of now easily available, just at admission controls. If you already have workloads which are running with these insecure settings, 
Kiverno will also produce a policy report, and those reports are also available within the cluster as a Kubernetes resource itself, right? So again, going from just a stock cluster to going to a pretty secure cluster in a few seconds is possible now. And that's really, you know, our, our part of our goal of introducing Kiverno and as a project is to make sure Kubernetes can be, you know, as secure by default as possible in an easy to use manner. Um, and these type of, again, developers, to go back to your question, are aware of, okay, what needs to be done to their workload to be able to secure it and configure it correctly. You can also write, by the way, mutating policies to automatically inject some of this uh, data and those examples on, on the Kiverno website of those as well. Nice. Okay, so we're setting up sort of the use cases, the problems we're solving, we're moving the obligation from developers to actually be the expert and expect their YAML to be perfect. What things aren't covered by this that someone also needs to be concerned by? Like I, I mentioned a whole bunch of stuff earlier, but are there areas that these kind of policy gates aren't covering? Yeah, or great question, right? So there are a few, you know, I guess for lack of a better term, you can call them like corner cases or dark corners in Kubernetes. Like right. one of the areas was if you kind of run static pods, which the kubelet itself can directly bring up, right? So it used to be that the API server does not see those, but now there, there is a concept of mirror pods, which gets created as part of that creation and the API server does have access to them. Even things like if you want to exec into a pod, there is an API request that is triggered for that. So more and more, most of the operations that you would want to do within a, a Kubernetes cluster are covered through admission controllers and policy engines like Kiverno. Of course, if you're trying to verify now, there's things like CIS benchmarks, which would not be covered by Kiverno because those are checking for cluster configurations. And depending on how you're bringing up your cluster, if you're using a managed uh, cluster like through a cloud provider, those would have to be checked at a different level, right? They're not visible inside the cluster itself. Yeah. So cluster operators don't get to tool use these tools to help them deploy a properly secured Kubernetes host, for example. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Where do you see this going? I think I saw right. that it was like 1.6 release. What are we not doing yet that we could enhance in the future with Caverno? Yeah, so certainly today, and it's a lot of folks are uh, still at the level, you know, and because of the complexity of Kubernetes, now control planes are being deployed securely, right? So that seems like step one and through whether it's through managed service providers or through even using KubeADM and other tooling, which has mm -hmm. evolved and become very usable. But one, once that happens, the next step is to, you know, kind of have pod security, which we just kind of went through as a quick demo. There's other challenges and that you mentioned the policy working group. So there we certainly take a more holistic approach to policy for cloud native and for Kubernetes. And we also, through the working group, what we have done is taken the same policy reporting format that's available in Kiverno, and that's being proposed as a CRD, as a custom resource, which can be used by other policy engines as well. Mm -hmm. And that could be admission controls, right? So through the policy working group, we have adapters now for KubeBench, which can do the CIS benchmarks I was just kind of referring to, and produce a, a policy report, which can be now consumed by administrative tools like what we do at Nirmata and other you know kind of tools which would provide a more comprehensive kind of viewpoint of your Kubernetes and, and your cluster security. Similarly for vulnerability scan reports, for things like even runtime security concerns. So there's, you know, Falco as well as KubeArmor and other projects which are using eBPF for runtime security, right? To detect some of these things, which maybe the admission controller doesn't catch. So looking at it from a more comprehensive uh, perspective, we recommend Really those four things to have periodic vulnerability scanning done in your CI CD pipeline, those reports be available to policies and then to be able to, you know, do admission controls. 
which is your really your last line of defense before things go into a cluster to be able to do CIS benchmarks at the cluster configuration levels. And then as a final kind of a checkpoint to also have something that's listening to runtime events and checking for things which are unexpected, right? Which look like abnormal behaviors, which should be reported. Right. Like an exec command or a shell running in, in the pod or something like that. Yeah. Right. So, so one thing to, to point out, even exec commands can be admission controls will catch those, right? Because there is a connect request, which is sent to the API, API server yeah. and Kiverno can have a policy. Let me see if I can find an example of that in our policy library. Yep. So this is a policy which blocks exec. So it's the connect request and based on label, it will say you cannot exec into this pod, right? So you could flip this on by default, but this example is just showing. And notice here, the Kiverno policy is actually making an API server call. It's checking for the label of the namespace and, and then enforcing this policy on certain namespaces. Nice. So and maybe this is a good time. This kind of leads me to thinking about Nermata and like the correlation between the two and the difference of these two products. Because if I recall right, Nermata was started first. Like you actually had the company. Right. And then you had this idea of outsourcing this stuff for Kubernetes or open sourcing this stuff rather. Tell me a little bit about like that. Let's get into the, as people adopt this tool, I'm assuming there's a path to Nirmata for a superset. Is that right? Superset of functionality? There is. Nirmata started first. Kiverno kind of emerged out of Nirmata. And as we kind of were trying to figure out, okay, what should Kiverno focus on? And what will Nirmata provide above and beyond? Really, our, our mission is to make, again, to bring security automation to Kubernetes and, and make Kiverno full-featured. And like you see, we provide every policy we create. We also you know, contribute and the community contributes. So we're not trying to kind of say we're going to have some special content or special subscription in Nirmata. The approach we have taken, though, is when it comes to multi-cluster and managing policies at scale. And I'll just quickly show what Nirmata looks like. So this is, you know, I'm logged in into my account in Nirmata. I have a couple of clusters. If I drill into any cluster, I very easily now see some reports and things on policies, right? And I can use Nirmata to collaborate on policies to dig down, see exactly if violations exist and to get details even to assign ownership or to add an exclusion all of these things, which if you're managing a fleet of clusters, would be extremely difficult to do otherwise. Right. Nirmata helps with that security collaboration, the assignment of who should get these. So what security teams and, and ops teams love about this is they can not only... So first of all, this grade is a nice uh, feature because it immediately <laughs> tells you, hey, look. Wait, shouldn't some you have an A? <laughs> I would think that you would have an <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, this is some demo cluster somebody's right. attached into this account, right? But yeah, so now e immediately as if I'm the owner of this namespace or this workload, I can go and see what do I need to fix and how do I kind of get to that? I can also get alerts. So you can set up kind of those alerts from your various policy groups. So here we have a bunch of default policy groups, everything from best practices to pod security. If you are using projects like Crossplane, you can even write policies like one of my colleagues wrote a policy here to prevent RDS access or restrict what can be configured there, right? So lots of interesting use cases, some on the supply chain security, multi-tenancy is another huge topic where there's a lot of interesting use cases for policies. But once that's done, yeah, it's just a matter of providing in Nirmata, simple, easy to use reporting kind of being able to dive in, share and collaborate on these and, and manage them at scale, right? So that's kind of where we see the bounds. The other interesting thing is we also see, of course, integrations into, especially as we're talking about some of these more complex use cases, like with supply chain security, integrations into other tooling, which Nirmata can do operating at the SaaS level, uh, which makes it, again, easier to, to manage a lot of this at scale. So underneath, we're still running Caverno on the clusters, right? And this is sort of like a management layer on top? Correct. Yeah, okay. So I guess for me as a new person, I need to learn 
Caverno first and then sort of adapt that? And then does this help with the deployment methodology at all? Or it, like, should I be starting with Nermata if I'm going to even consider this? What does the adoption look like typically? So we see both, right? We see a lot of Caverno users drop in a Nermata controller and start collaborating on policies, things like that. And we do have a you know free version to use. We do see also, if you start with Nirmata, Nirmata can help and it will deploy Kiverno automatically. So mm -hmm. the onboarding path, and I'll just quickly show what that looks like. If I go to clusters, if I say add cluster, and let's say I wanted to even add my mini cube cluster, as you would expect, you know, basically I can select a cloud provider and then it will let me download a YAML, run that on my cluster. And now I have attached that into Nirmata, right? Once that cluster is attached, it really operates like any other cluster. So here I have a vSphere cluster, which is showing me my policy report and my scores, and it will automatically also deploy the recommended policies, right? So that can be configured again centrally. So you could say, well, if you see this default label, it means those policies will be pushed down by default. So for example, for best practices, not using the latest tag, right? It's a simple thing, but a good best practice to enforce. So this policy will be in a push down. It, it's in audit mode by default. So it just shows you where the violations are and, and gives kind of developers a chance to fix that. Now, keep in mind also as a best practice, these policies can also be applied in your CI CD pipeline. So you get that as soon as you kind of submit a PR or you make a change in your manifest. You can run Caverno there and, and see some of the kind of uh, outputs as well as what needs to be fixed. But uh, from the Nirmata point of view, going back to your question, either you can start with Nirmata, deploy Caverno and get the default policies in, which is very simple to do. Or you can start, if you're already using Caverno, Nirmata recognizes that and will not you know change anything, but will start showing the visibility, the tracking and allow the collaboration and other features on it. Nice. Yeah, that seems to flow pretty well together. And um, I really like the projects that, I mean, this, this is kind of becoming the default, right? In cloud native, where the essence or the core of the SaaS product is open source and a part of the CNCF. Right. And then there's this extra layer added on top, which honestly, at the end of the day, like I talk about a lot on the show where I say, you know, I don't know anyone with free time. I don't know any ops, security, DevOps teams, developer teams that have suddenly free time to manage more open source projects. And that you're, I always talk about that you're either giving, it costs you either in time or money, choose one. Right. Most of the teams I, t I talk to have a little money. And so I'm always looking for that easy way for them to learn and apply something, but also let's make it easier by just managing it with the SaaS, right? And so- right. It's great that you had Nirmata first, I think. Uh, it's not the normal strategy, but I, I think that that really helps you have a mature product uh, that people can adapt instead of it just being like a beta. And, and you've had this for years, right? So this is something that we right. have got all these customers on. For Nirmata, we've talked a little bit about like, what's next maybe for the policy in general. Are there any sort of like, what's the future of Nirmata? What are you looking at? Yeah, so certainly a few things we're very focused on uh, is, if, first off, so policies are great at an operational layer, but there's also this you know need for solving a lot of problems at the compliance and governance layer, right? So policies become the right building block for that and having policies as code, as first class, Kubernetes resources, having the policy reports in place, all now allow us to automate compliance and governance. So that's very exciting. That's more for the security teams within these organizations and Nirmata offers those features. So you can start building your compliance mappings. You can say, okay, if I want to follow the best practices for CIS benchmarks or NSA hardening, how do I do that, right? What does my checklist look like? And underneath we're using Kiverno policies. So our whole approach is to be very open and flexible with those, but with, you know, you get sort of instant value again from the Nirmata perspective. The other angle and the other kind of area where we continue to expand and we see a lot of exciting room to grow as well is in, if you kind of look at the entire software supply chain and within the policy working group, there was a, you know, paper published recently on Kubernetes policy management which emphasizes the need for 
policy starting early in the software development lifecycle, right? And mm -hmm. the CI CD pipelines today, of course, enterprises who are once maybe deploying two or three releases a year yeah. are doing dozens of pushes to production daily by adopting these cloud native technologies and, you know, modern CI CD pipelines. So it's very important that within these, uh, that those systems also be secured. And within those systems, there's a need to start producing data, which policies can then enforce at admission controls and at runtime through background scanning. So things like vulnerability scans, and this is very rapidly evolving today. At one point, it used to be, you would have to go with a proprietary or closed system to get value for end-to-end -end vulnerability scan reports, right? Right. Now there are emerging standards where you can use open source tools to produce scan reports in, let's say, a VEX compliance standard, which is something being proposed by as part of the Cyclone DX, you know, kind of family of standards. So it could be any tool that produces this, this vulnerability scan report. And then through projects like SigStore, assigning that scan report in the CI CD pipeline with the right provenance data, making that available to policy engines like Kiverno really becomes exciting, right? Because now you yeah. can complete that entire picture and have traceability end to end to say, I know exactly where my image was built. I know which workflow or builder kind of or machine built this. And I know what kind of attestations I can enforce that there's a scan report produced, which has to be, let's say, within the last three days. It has to have certain vulnerability scores. Or if I want to go and search for certain packages in an SBOM, I can start doing that, right? Which even yeah. just six months ago was like, how would you, it's such a daunting set of things to, to tackle, but now it's possible uh, through open source and intercompatible, you know, kind of these standards and things which are emerging. And you're talking about all this on running infrastructure, which is, I think, right? That's what you're not talking about build time stuff, which is historically the way we all found out is at, at compile time right. or at like server build time or maybe right before an audit, right? <laughs> we do all the right. scans right before the audit and then the audit passes and we're good to go. We had to do a bunch of work, fix a bunch of things, audit passes, now we're back to normal. And then it go, we go dark because it's a lot of human effort to do a lot of these things, like you're talking about CVE right. scans, SBOM vulnerability, dependency issues. And you're right, it's kind of operationally, we've traditionally focused on is it up right. or are we being attacked and stuff like that rather than are we aware that even in a perfect world of Kubernetes where it's all supposed to be, we're running read only container images and all this stuff, but things, everything is fluid. Everything changes over time. The system that was secure yesterday is probably not secure next week. And right. It's, it, you're right. It is, there's an additional problem where even if you get to that level where there are things happening daily or there's scans or there's information that's being tracked daily. It's still very disparate, right? We've, you end up with dozens of tools. This tool focuses on CVE scan, but it doesn't bring awareness in a central console anywhere. It's not like I'm getting in my monitoring console alerts around CVE, new CVEs that affect my production cluster while I'm staring at my monitoring op screen. That's not a normal thing. Right. You obviously have are on the tip of the spear of this infrastructure, and I'm sort of the I'm the user that finds out years later that this stuff is possible. <laughs> is Kubernetes at the forefront of all this stuff? Where we're like the CNCF, obviously that's where our our workloads are running. And you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned OWASP. We should probably bring that up, or just even define what that is. Where should people be looking for this stuff besides yeah. Nirmata? Right. So certainly a lot of things going on in the Kubernetes community. So there are security working groups. So there's tag security in the tags is technical advisory group. And then there's six security, which is special interest group. So six security focuses at the Kubernetes level and tag security focuses at the CNCF level, right? So those are great starting points. There's subgroups. There's a entire software supply chain subgroup within tag security, which is a, another great group uh, of folks working towards a, a lot of what I was just describing to see how software supply chains can be secured end to end, what are all of the components. And then there's also another Linux foundation project, and I'll quickly, I can share my screen and show that as well, yeah. called Sixstore, 
which is aiming to do for for software container image signing and other related technologies what in many ways let's encrypt ended up doing for certificate management right mm. so six store is another great community it's also part of the linux foundation so it's a kind of a sister community to cncf and six store has a set of technologies one of the things we've integrated into kiverno is something called cosign and Cosign is this tool used, I, I think folks might be familiar with things like Notary and also Tough as the framework for Docker also was uh, instrumental in developing that. So Six Store has made, you know, signing and verification a lot easier and primarily for container uh, images, but can be used for anything, for blobs, for files for other artifacts, like one of the features we are prepping for Kiverno is also to be able to sign and verify YAMLs, right? Because if you have policies now as Kubernetes manifest, how do you make sure your policies are coming from the right sources and you can trust that policy, right? So those sort of things, the six store and cosign make super easy to do. And within Kiverno, we have full support. If you kind of look at the image verification rule, it has support for now integration into Six Store, which can check. This is a very simple policy to check that every image that matches this pattern has been signed by a particular public key, right? Nice. So yeah. this is what we're, and going back to your question on Nirmata and what have you focused on, we're kind of also integrating with the broader ecosystem around this to be able to make this as seamless and simple as possible for consumers everywhere, right? And the other part of this here, you went back to like you know, your question on Kubernetes and its role. One other interesting kind of thought is Kubernetes is becoming very rapidly, almost as a control plane for everything, right? So it's no longer just about applications and workloads, but you can provision cloud services through Kubernetes using projects like Crossplane, there's projects like Tekton, and Tekton is very often talked about if you're using for secure CICD pipelines. But there is a sub-project called Tekton Chains, which allows building container images, things like that, which can be signed, which can produce the right attestations, and then verified through Kiverno policies or other policy engines. Nice. Yeah, I think that there's definitely a... I mean, just for me as an implementer, I find it challenging. You know, I, I can choose products. I get that. But th there's a challenge where not everyone I work with has a dedicated security team that it considers Kubernetes their responsibility, right? So it tends to leave it up to the DevOps team, possibly even just a DevOps person that's playing the ops role, or maybe some sysadmins that maybe they understand Kubernetes like they understand kubeadmin or rancher or whatever their deployment mechanism is for the infrastructure but this the world of policy and security is something that i feel like sometimes they're years away from right just because there's so much new to them especially for ones that are just starting to adopt kubernetes in the last few years and it's always great to hear that we've got consensus because i think that's one of the things that i even try to attempt on this channel is how do people make the choice like first what are the choices i have and what choice do I make? And how do I even comprehend the choice of so many of these tools, so many options? And because this stuff doesn't necessarily come out of the box with Kubernetes, a lot of times you know, people are still implementing pod security policies, right? They're typing it in the YAML right. of every one of their Kubernetes resources. And I'll often find a team that as on their journey, they'll run a, a kube scan of some sorts and it'll warn them that, hey, you know, you're not preventing re escalation of permissions. And so they'll suddenly go through this huge effort of going into every Kubernetes resource, right? And for every pod, they're applying this one line or, or five lines or whatever it is right. to implement this standard that someone said, oh, you're, you now need to fix this. And it's not really a comprehensive approach, I find. It's very sort of hit or miss. And they ran a scanner, it complained about a thing. They did, they fixed that one thing. And I love this approach where we can start applying a lot of these sort of policy and security focused tools at a, like you said, you talked about a fleet, which I love that because right. who has one Kubernetes cluster? The hobbyist, that's who has it, like me in the closet. <laughs> that's the only person that has one, yeah. one cluster. So it, it's very, it's necessary, I feel like almost up front for us to think, okay, how do we do this at a fleet level, not at 
I got a Kubernetes cluster with some resources on it and I'm applying a line of YAML into my Kubernetes. And I, I love educating developers, but at the end of the day, they've got so much to worry about that I, right. I love that we can remove this approach to something and put it somewhere else, give someone else that job and, the, and they can sort of be the, the policy maintainer. Just to kind of add on that last thought, right? So even Kubernetes, of course, is constantly evolving, right? So there's configurations that change, there's new best practices that emerge, there's CVEs that uh, show up. So all of this requires policies. Uh, it, it's not a one, one off or a one time thing. It needs to be continuously monitored, managed and maintained just like a workload, right? So. Having that capability, I, I think we believe is key to success and with Kubernetes and really helps again, like smoothen these handoffs between developers, operators, security teams, and other stakeholders uh, around Kubernetes. Yeah. I'm going to get to some questions real quick. Cause I feel like yeah. we've got some people with some good stuff in here. Conrad asks, how does this compare to the Calico network policies, basically? Good question, right? So network policies, there's the built-in Kubernetes network policy. There's also the Calico and Istio kind of have their own flavors of network policies and control. So those are mostly concerned with preventing traffic at some level, whether it's layer two to four or higher layer seven uh, across workloads, right? What we're, Kiverno policies are a much a kind of deeper level. You can use Kiverno to generate network policies, either Calico or in a default Kubernetes network policies, but they are more concerned with configuration security, right? So making sure the best practices for any workload configuration for pod security and for network policies are enforced. And you can just make it easier instead of your developers writing a network policy Maybe, you know, and we see this as a common pattern, you just ask them to add a label to the namespace and you can write a Kiverno policy to automatically generate the network policy for them. So things like that become very simple and doesn't require now developers to learn how to manage, test, write network policies. Yeah. I feel like at the beginning, all these things were separate, right? We go back three years, whatever, you know, so our back was separate from network policy, which is separate from pod policies, like so many of these different layers that were all related to the same people implementing and ma managing and maintaining it, but all were disparate sort of ideas on the necessary things for a cluster, right? So that's a really good question, Conrad. Thank you. The next question he has is pretty good. This is referring to uh, previously, is your recommendation to start with Caverno in the beginning? And I think you kind of answered that, but could you just reiterate for our audience? So short answer, yes. Yeah, so we definitely advocate. So at, at the least you, you require some level of pod security, right? So the options today are, are you, you kind of look at what's coming with pod security admission which lets you put namespace level labels to define uh, a pod security level. The challenge that we have heard from users on that is it's not very flexible because it's very typical within a namespace, you have that one Nginx pod, which requires some perhaps privileges or other you know kind of configuration to be uh, allowed. And you don't want to give that same access to all the other pods or all the other workloads. So then at that point, you do need to run an admission control and Kiverno becomes a pretty good choice to look at. There's a uh, V support and test and in the community, a set of pod security policies. So getting just starting with that as a default is certainly a very good practice. And then also looking at the best practice policies, like we talked about for default network policies, as well as things like making sure that every pod has a liveness and readiness probe or making sure that every pod is declaring some resource quotas and right. things like that, which become very important uh, when you go into production, you can start enforcing and educating your developers and your teams through Kiverno. And, and that's the nice thing is it becomes this kind of digital contract again, which you're saying, hey, these are the best practices. You can start with audit mode and then require maybe in production, you want to block certain configurations, but you can just start with auditing and allowing those. Yeah. And as a reminder, all of this is still YAML Kubernetes resources, right? Correct. Yeah. So yes. that means we can implement a GitOps approach. We can have it documented in the Git log. And that's where I love, obviously you want that 
component that's validating and verifying that it's implemented. But I love that we're keeping all this stuff in Git. And it's one of the questions I often ask of everyone on the show. It's like, okay, how can I do what, how can I do everything you just did in the browser, but do that in Git? How can I do that in YAML? Because often, you know, we've all got all these different tools, right? And when we, it's rare that there's one person doing the development and the ops and the DevOps all at one person. So you tend to have multiple people and there's always this challenge of how do we ensure that these things will often change over time, right? There's never just the day one policy that stands forever. It's always something that's evolving. And how do right. we track the changes? How do we all come together so that everyone can view the policies, including the business side? And I've actually got a team now on a consulting gig where we're doing that thing where we're sort of teaching them how now all this stuff you're doing, we got to get it into Git. <laughs> and and right. it's sort, sort of like I'm standing on the soapbox, get that into Git, put that into Git, stop using the command line tool, put it into Git. Yeah. Yeah. So it's great that, I mean, Kubernetes provides that foundation for us. All right. I think I've got a couple more questions for you. We're going to do rapid fire. So Charlie is asking, what is the idea essentially around, is this something that's likely to get merged into Kubernetes or like these, you know, we have these different policy management products and, and CNCF projects. Do you see a future where those are sort of put upstream into Kubernetes directly? Not, you know, as part of the core Kubernetes project itself, just because you're kind of sticking with the layered approach. And much like if you're running any Kubernetes cluster, you're very likely to be running Prometheus or a metric server or things like that. We believe and we would like Kiverno to become part of that de facto stack, but to so certainly, and strengthening the what Kiverno can do in terms of integrations with the API server, we will continue in term, for that support and expanding it. But I don't see it becoming part of core Kubernetes itself just because okay. of keeping that layer clean and separate. Right. Okay. Next question, Biker, coming from my Windows crew, are policies connected to RBAC and specifically systems like AD? Active Directory. Yes. So great question, right? So RBAC is another, of course, uh, Kubernetes provides, you know, RBAC capabilities and, and, you know, it's pretty good. You can do quite a lot with it. One of the challenges though we see is when it comes to fine-grained permissions, our, our back gets a little bit kludgy to work with and Kiverno can help there by automating the creation, deletion of our back, you know, roles as well as role bindings based on other triggers, right? So let's say you deploy a namespace and you only want to give the person who created that namespace the right to delete that namespace. You can now automate things like that with Kiverno fairly easily. So Kiverno can be used to enrich and extend RBAC itself. And, and the second part of your question, like connecting to an identity system like Active Directory, that's very interesting too, right? Because Kubernetes by default, as, as everyone probably knows, is doesn't have a concept of a user or there's no built-in identity, right? Mm. You need to talk to some, you know, some external AD or some IDP where you can pull your identity information from. So we have seen, there was a great webinar done by Ohio Supercomputers. They're a user of Kimerno. They're very active in our community. So they tied into their LDAP system and they're doing HPC on demand, basically we're using Kimerno policies so their students can come in and request like a Jupyter Notebook or an HPC environment, and they will create the right namespace, the workload, go to their LDAP system, and based on that identity, make sure that they are allowing the right user with access to the right resources within that cluster, right? So all of this can be kind of pulled together. And again, policies, if you start thinking about policies for automation, there's a lot of these interesting use cases that, you know, come up. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm particularly excited that it's all on the same base stuff, right? And I've, I've right. said this four or three times already in this podcast, but the idea that I don't have to implement a whole new set of workflows for the team to implement these kind of tools. That's just one of the things I think that Kubernetes has really laid the foundation for. So if there's one thing that I'm excited about in the future of Kubernetes is that as you want to add these layers, you don't have to start with them on day one and you can add them later and you don't have to implement a whole new workflow and team just to implement some of these policies. And I love how Nermano is making it easier for that stuff. So great question. Biker always brings the hard, hard questions too. So he's on the show with the chat to bring the edge cases like like Windows, which is close to my heart being a, being a Windows admin for 30 years now, I think just about. Um, 
So, Jim, this was awesome. I learned so much. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much for being on the show. My pleasure. Yeah, and I'm excited to try these products out. I think for me, even coming from a background of security, having these tools has always been, it's always seemed a little intimidating to me to implement them. And I always felt like I had to learn a lot of the other languages and the fact that this can be in a Kubernetes YAML resource and that I can have optionally a web dashboard to help me uh, understand this stuff, even implement it easier, really kind of, I think for me, helps me feel like it's not gonna be a huge lift for me or my students or customers to, to implement that. So thank right. you. No, you're most welcome. And thank you to the entire Kimono community. You're super excited to continue building and growing. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to uh, the, the next updates. So when you get this next major release, I'm looking forward to having you back on the show. You're now going to be reinvited <laughs> to talk about the future of this stuff. Because I think uh, there's more to be talked about for sure. Like we could right. we could sit here for another three hours, I think, and talk about the, all the different projects, the working groups, where to go find more information, how to dive in deep beyond just learning one tool. So we're definitely going to have more of that, I think, on this show in the future. So Absolutely. would love to. Let's wrap it up real quick. Where So people go to nirmata.com. That's N-I-R-M-A-T-A.com for the product. You can also find links, I'm sure, to Caverno there. Caverno is K-Y-V-E-R-N-O for those listening. And they, they can. I'm assuming there's documentation, getting started guides, all the things there, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so Caverno.io has all the Caverno docs, nirmata.com uh, is where you can go to find info on Nirmata and the docs as well. Yeah, I see a big free trial button there, so I can click that and play with my clusters that way. And people can find you and Nirmata on Twitter, so they can reach out to you with questions, and I encourage everyone to do that as they're playing Absolutely. with these tools. So, so you said you, you mentioned a community. Is there, are there community resources? Do you have like a Slack? Yeah, or so, a... Yes, so the Kiverno Slack is on the Kubernetes workspace, uh, so the channel is just Kiverno. You can find us there and... Certainly, there's uh, most of the maintainers hang out there all the time. So feel free to post any questions. And also, you know, on, on some of the other communities, they're all in the CNCF workspace as well as the Kubernetes workspace on Slack. Nice. So for those of you who didn't know, if you're maybe new to Kubernetes, there's a CNCF and a Kubernetes Slack work groups that you can, uh, workspaces that you can check out. And most of the projects, if not all of them, have channels there that you can talk to other people. So thanks again for everyone. Thanks, Jim and the team. And we will see you next week. So again, the show's every Thursday. Podcast drops on Friday, shows on Thursday. Thank you. Bye-bye.